All right, hi everybody. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the nature and method of economics. Um, our objective is to be able to understand how to answer questions regarding how to see the world as an economist. So an economist sees the world through things like supply and demand, scarcity, scarcity marginal analysis, and they use these fundamental um, ideas in order to analyze the world. And so today we're going to be talking about some of those fundamental ideas and we're going to be talking about um, what economics is and the economic perspective. And we'll go ahead and go from there. All right, so let's talk about the economic perspective. So economists view the world through the lens of scarcity. Mankind has unlimited wants, but limited resources. So how are these scarce resources going to be distribute, distributed? This is the fund, fundamental question of economics. In fact, scarcity is the fundamental problem of economics because we all want a lot of stuff, but there isn't a lot to go around. So we've got to figure out how um, these limited resources are going to be distributed. That is... Um, economics, the study of how mankind distributes their scarce resources. So economics is based on the idea that people are rational, and rational to an economist means this, they are acting in their self-interest. So going back to scarcity, basically what that means is as human beings we want everything, but we can't have it because goods are scarce. So how are those scarce goods going to be um, distributed? Okay, that is the fundamental problem of economics, scarcity, and being rational is an important um, part of economics, particularly uh, classical economics that we are um, going to be studying. All right, so let's take a look at a real-life scenario here. All right, when people are buying things, okay, this definitely expresses the idea of scarcity. So I want you to think for a moment, how does buying things express this idea of scarcity? One way to look at it is that there are, when we buy things, there are a limited amount of goods out there, a limited amount of, in this case, clothes. And mankind and societies, they have to figure out how they're going to go ahead and distribute, how they're going to allocate those clothes and those are done through cost through buying things with money if something's free uh, then many oftentimes those goods are going to be allocated through time people waiting in line to get the free good but no matter what society is going to find some way to allocate those resources and buying things is a great example of resources being allocated through money which in and of itself is a scarce resource. Now let's look at this person right here. Interesting uh, person here. And so I want to ask you another question. Do you think this person's decision is irrational? Is this person person acting in irrational in an irrational manner? Well, one of the fundamental assumptions of economics is that people act in a rational manner. Okay, people are acting in their self-interest. So this person here is acting in their self-interest. There might be various reasons why they're deciding to uh, put all this jewelry on themselves and tattoo themselves or whatever it might be. But nevertheless, um, according to economic thought, this person is rational. This person is acting in their self-interest interest. Now there are some branches of economics like behavioral economics that kind of looks at possible irrationalities and so forth, uh, but we're really going to be focusing here on a classical um, economics which does make that assumption that people um, act rationally, meaning that they act in their self-interest. All right, so the next thing I want to look at, the next uh, fundamental term I want to look at here is the margin. Okay, Economists love to look at decisions at the margin. When you're thinking at the margin, the margin is the weighing of additional costs and additional benefits of specific changes in the current situation. 
So most choices we all make involve changes in the status quo, uh, changes in the current state of affairs. These choices are marginal decisions. And generally a marginal decision is going to involve a change of one unit. So most of the time when we make decisions, we're going to decide, are we going to, are we going to do one more thing or one less thing or whatever it might be. So we might decide, are we going to study one more hour? Are we going to be buying one more Big Mac? Are we going to be buying um, one more hammer? Whatever it might be. Okay, whenever we make a decision, Oftentimes, we're going to be making them at the margin. Okay, we're going to be deciding, are we going to do one more of something? Okay, so think of to yourself some marginal decisions that you have made. All right, now, continuing on with marginal uh, here, you have economists love to use what's called marginal analysis. When economists use marginal analysis, they're comparing the marginal benefits and marginal costs. So when you make a decision to do something, you do it because the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. So the benefit of doing that additional thing is greater than the cost. So for example, when you decided to get up today and go to school, you did it because the marginal benefit was greater than the marginal cost. The benefit of you get, getting up and going to school is greater than the cost. Of doing it. So it's important to keep in mind that when people choose to do things, they do them because the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. That is an important part of economic rationality. So let me give you some examples here. Um, let's say you saw a hundred dollar bill lying on the ground. Think to yourself, would you not want to pick this $100 bill up lying on the ground? Or why would you do that? Okay, why would you pick it up? Because the marginal benefit of doing, uh, of doing that action, the marginal benefit of picking up the $100 bill is at least equal to the marginal cost. I have a story one of my buddies loves to tell about me. Before I got my new car, uh, I had like an old junker car, and what I would do is I'd store pennies in uh, one of the little side pockets of the car. Well, that side pocket started leaking, and the pennies actually started kind of leaking out of my car into my garage, and so I had pennies all over the place, all over my garage. And so one time my buddy is standing in my garage, he looks around, he looks at the floor, and he looks at me, and he says, you want to earn a couple bucks? I'm like, sure. He's like, pick up all these pennies and take them to Coinstar and get yourself a couple bucks. I, I said, no, I'm not going to do that. He said, why? I said, because the marginal benefit isn't greater than the marginal cost. And he looked at me like I'm such a nerd. But nevertheless, that's true. Um, there was, there is a cost in terms of me picking up those pennies. So you can think to yourself, what are some of uh, the costs of picking up a penny. Um, obviously it takes time to pick up those pennies. Obviously there might be some strain on my body to pick up those pennies. So for me, the marginal benefit of picking up a penny, and the benefit would be just a penny, was not greater than the marginal cost. And even if I picked up all those pennies, it wasn't greater um, than the cost, which is the time and the physical, um, the physical nature of picking up those pennies. Okay, so you can see that economists love to do what's called cost-benefit analysis. They love to take a look at so what are the benefits of doing something and what are the costs. And if the benefits are greater than the cost, then we should go ahead and do it. If the benefits are not greater than the cost, if the cost are greater than the benefits, then we shouldn't do it. So cost-benefit analysis is key to understanding economic rationality. Now this picture here is uh, represents a phrase, and that phrase is the straw that broke the camel's back. It's a fairly common phrase, and it 
does a good job of um, showing marginal analysis. Because what's happening here is that one additional unit, one additional straw, for example, just broke the camel's back, did the camel in. All right, now let's look at economic methodology. So economists use the scientific method to describe economic phenomena. Now, you guys have seen the scientific method before, but it's probably going to be in your physics, chemistry classes, etc. You probably haven't seen it. Um, in the social science arena, which is what you are doing right now, um, economists are going to use a very similar scientific method to describe economic phenomena. Basically what this means is that economists are going to form a hypothesis and test it by comparing the outcomes of specific events. So the process of deriving theories and principles is called theoretical economics. And the goal of this, all this theorizing, is to arrange these facts and to generalize, and thus creating economic principles or laws. So for example, what an economist might do is they might look at the world and see that when the price of a product goes down, the quantity demand goes up. And that makes sense. When the price goes down, people are going to buy more. So when the price of a product goes down, quantity demand goes up. So that's a hypothesis. They go out there, they collect data, they observe, um, and they see if that data proves that hypothesis right. And if it does, then they go ahead and uh, they've created a theory, and then that theory ultimately can become a law. And in that case, that is the law of demand, the idea, and we're going to talk about that in a few days here, that's the idea that when the price of a product goes down, the quantity demanded goes up.